everyone. Good morning, afternoon, evening. Let's just give uh, everybody a few seconds to get their sounds working, and then we can start. Okay, um, so while, while we're settling, uh, but we'll continue our session today on the AI and machine learning, and uh, it's been a, a lot of buzz globally, right? Um, Chat GPT and, uh, and the rest. So, and in the next uh, four Data Thursday sessions, we'll be having uh, different uh, internal, external speakers talk to us about AI and machine and uh, uh, open AI and machine learning work. Last week we had uh, Mikola and Guyan uh, talk us through the basics of uh, AI 101. And uh, I know there was a lot of questions in that session on you know, when are we going to get access in UNDP? What does that look like? What will it look like uh, within our own tenant? Um, so it's, that's part of why we're happy to have uh, Microsoft here today uh, for you to talk us through some of that. Uh, we'll not have all the answers today, but we're getting closer. Uh, we had a session on Monday uh, with Microsoft uh, where we're able to get into some of the things that have been developed and uh, we will hear about some of those uh, today. So I'm happy to have Steve uh, here. And many of you know Steve uh, that has worked with us a lot in UNDP uh, with our Microsoft uh, licenses and system is a technology strategist for Microsoft. Uh, and then we'll have Taisha uh, Ferguson, uh, there's a data and AI cloud solution architect uh, from Microsoft. And then Hugo Marquez will, as director of cloud solution architect, will also walk us through a demo of the system that is coming from Microsoft. Uh, so I uh, look forward to the session. Uh, the session has been recorded. And uh, for those of that miss, miss, miss this, they can be able to watch later. So I'll hand over to you, Steve. Do you want to? You have to share your screen and start to let's see if it works. Sounds good. All right, give me a thumbs up. Everything looks good. Yeah, it looks good. Right. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. So, thanks again for for having me here today. Uh, great to be talking with you and DP. Like I said, we just spoke uh, with a lot of folks on 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 Monday, um, and really talking about the era of AI and, and how. We believe now and inside of Microsoft, we believe that, my, that this is not just hyperbole, right? That this is actually a significant change in, in the industry. Um, and, we, and we think it's gonna be a change on the scale of like the impact of robotics and process automation did with, with manufacturing, um, especially for organizations that are information worker heavy, which UNDP, UN organizations are, 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 are a key component of that information worker um, segment. So, you know, I, just to tell you a quick story, I got to see this actually happen live in person. I saw a person actually realize that the world was shifting. Um, and, I, and I watched it on, on the person's face as, 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 as they realized that the skill that they were doing was no longer something that they were going to be needing to do in the future. I was recently at a, at a conference. Microsoft was asked to speak at with one of our, our UN or family organizations. And, and they were having a conference and they asked us to come and, and give some sessions, like seven or eight sessions. And, and one of those sessions was on open AI. And my colleague, he, he was going through scenario after scenario of how AI could be integrated into the workflow of, of, of the organization. And I happened to notice, I looked over and I saw that there was a person like furiously taking notes. And I realized that it was a UN like note taker. Like it was, they wanted to capture the meeting information and the session information so that they could report that back up as part of a, you know, overall recap of the week's activities. And about 20 minutes into the session, I saw her just stop, just stop and closed her laptop. And I realized that she had realized that my colleague who was showing how you can easily summarize meetings and information that, that, that skill was no longer necessary. And sure enough, as soon as the session ended, she walked over to him, hey, can you give me a summary of your everything that you spoke about? He went down, tapped into ChatGPT, and two seconds later, she had her summary. 
Now, on one hand, it's sort of a scary, we're transitioning into something new, workers will be doing the shift in the way that they, they use their skills, way that they use their day, but it also provides a huge opportunity, right? It's an opportunity to gain an efficiency level of getting some time back to focus on more important tasks. And if you think about it, it's like, say you could get another 20% back in your week. It's like having a whole extra day um, or an extra week in a month or a couple of months in a year. But the thing at Microsoft and our Tech for Social Impact team, what we're most excited about is the potential to help augment and push forward the 2030 agenda, right? We lost so much time when we took a look when we, during COVID and some of our metrics that we were trying to progress towards the SDGs, we did a little bit of backtracking. But imagine that we get a whole nother year to influence member states, uh, citizens, corporations to kind of change the way that they're doing things to make a better world for, for folks, you know, for, for future generations. And so that's, that's why at Tech for Social Impact, we're super excited about that. But how do we get here, right? It, it's sort of, uh, how did AI just appear six months ago, right? And ChatGPT showed up and I think it was November last year. All of a sudden, like it, it took the world by storm. Like it had a hundred million users within five days, which was greater than TikTok and YouTube and all the social medias that were out there. That growth rate was, was exponential. And this is, this is Steve Gemmel's the reason why I think this era of AI is all came together right now. And the first one is, is the large learning models or large language models. Um, we've had these for a while. It's not like they just appeared yesterday. The researchers, we've been doing this work for a number of years and it's just kind of building on the work. No, but if it's, I feel like it will come out. Oh, someone might be on. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit wet. I don't wanna do. pause for a sec. Great. So, um, so the, like I said, they, they, we've been working on this for a while. But at this point, we now have the compute capacity and the models are now providing uh, accurate information to be able to integrate into a lot of our production applications, integrate into the systems uh, that we're now using today. The second thing is the chat interface. And, and the thing about this is like, it's a construct that we're all very familiar with, right? We've been using this for 20, 30, 40 years you have the square, you know, the rectangle box and then a little rectangle at the bottom and a send button. Everybody across the world, doesn't matter what region you're from, doesn't matter what age bracket you're from, you're used to using these tools from, you know, Line, Signal, WeChat, uh, WhatsApp, Twitter, Skype, Teams. We're all very used to that chat interface. And this idea that we can go from questioning our friend or colleague about you know, a meeting I need to go to, or um, I wanna, where are we gonna meet for lunch to can I ask questions of a system? Can I have that, that interaction directly with my data? And that brings me to my third point and that's unstructured data. We've been trying to solve this problem for, for as long as I've been in IT. Uh, I recently read a Harvard business study that said Less than 1% of unstructured data is actually used in decision-making and analysis, and that 80% of an analyst's time is spent trying to find information rather than deriving insights. And so we've been trying to solve this problem forever, right? right? We had started with like, if we organize our data in the, just the right file system, right? Or then we said, let's move it into SharePoint. Let's make a intranet. And if we have the intranet, people will be able to find their data and be able to use that information. Or well, let's move it to the cloud. I can now access it wherever I'm at in the world. I have a laptop or a iPad. I can access my data wherever, wherever I need, or I have keyword search. I want Google search, but for my enterprise. But none of those things really solve the problem because those systems just help you find information that, or find data or find documents that might have the information you're looking for. What you're really looking for is just tell me the information I need, right? Who are the top 10 countries donating to, towards climate last year? Like that's the kind of interaction that we're really dreaming of and what we're really hoping for. And so as we've had these conversations with the IGO sector, like the ideas and the imagination of what we could potentially do is just amazing. Like we've had conversations with uh, UNOCC and they're like, we have to write a, a report that talks about everything that happened in mich mission peacekeeping every day for senior leaders and have it out by 12, 12 p.m. New York time. 
wouldn't it be great if that person just said, summarize these reports and then spent the most two or three hours actually digging into that and actually analyzing that information rather than just kind of orchestrating it and, and collecting that information, right? We talk about marketing sessions with UN uh, Office of Partnerships, right? Could we, I want to have an event on climate. How about you just tell me the people that are interested in climate that I've worked with over the last two years so that I can invite them to my session rather than the current way, which is who do I think? You know, you're, you're trying to remember, you ask some colleagues, you ask some friends, uh, you know, what do you remember or people that which I should invite to this, to this event? This is the type of things that we're starting to, these, these ideas are coming up and they sort of fall into four different buckets. The first one is content generation, right? So I wanna generate text or I wanna generate some images for my email, PowerPoint presentations, websites, uh, et cetera, or marketing. Like um, I want like that invite that I just spoke about. So show me who I should invite and help me actually write it in a way that's going to attract them to want to come to my, come to my uh, event. Summarization, I just spoke about how we could summarize all this data from multiple reports and multiple articles, pull this together uh, and, and go ahead and give me the, you know, summarize and show me the top five things that um, our successful projects in UNDP, show me what those lessons were, lessons learned were, or show me the five worst things that could happen, right? You can do these type of summarizations of your, of your content and your data. Semantic search, information discovery and knowledge mining. And my colleague Hugo is gonna show you that in a few minutes. And then the last one here is code generation. And this is something that's actually been around for over a year and a half with, you've heard, we heard about GitHub Copilot and how AI was helping to AI developers uh, AI was help developers develop their code. And what we're predicting is that over 80% of code is going to be developed by AI within the next, within the next few years. And so we're integrating all of these tools, like this idea of a co-pilot, this like pain that pops out from the, from the right side and, and helps you with your day-to-day -day activities across your Word and Excel into your business applications your Power BI, um, it's just across the entire, entire board. We believe that not only us, but every one of the application providers, internal IT organizations are gonna be building this AI technology so that a year from now, we're gonna, the way that we work and the way that we interact with our systems is going to be completely different. And so right before I, I hand over to my colleague, Hugo, um, this is just sort of the things, and this has really been a, a, a work in progress. Like we've been six months, we're now at the point where we have these architectural diagrams to provide you a chat interface to your unstructured content. And uh, I'll just go ahead and turn it over to Hugo and let him show you what it looks like rather than showing you a PowerPoint slide. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh... First of all, it's a big honor for me to be here with you, team. Uh, super excited to share my screen and uh, let's chat about your data. So that's the, what the session is about. So I'm going to share my screen really quickly. I'm going to do... All right. Uh, here we go. So... Uh, Thank you, thank you once again for the opportunity. My name is Hugo Marquez. Uh, I am the Cloud Solution Architect. Uh, and uh, once again, super excited to be here to talk about your data. So uh, last week, uh, I had the opportunity to be with a couple of uh, UNDP colleagues and uh, Steve Gemmo and uh, Teja, myself, and other Microsoft colleagues, we were talking about uh, the POP, like the place that you have the a huge amount of data there, the PDF files that you are able to search information and in, in consume and so on. And uh, I was browsing at the UNDP website and I found this annual report for 2022 and I was super excited. I said, okay, this is, Besides of good information, this is super well done. It's a beautiful report. And I went here and um, I see that uh, the future is, is hopeful uh, from Machine Stainer. And I said, oh, this is nice. 
uh, I would love to know about it. And maybe I don't have time to read the all report and everything. And I said, okay, let me go to my chat GPT. So of course, I'm gonna go there. I have the option here for GPT-3 or GPT-4, and I'm gonna ask about something like uh, what are Ashing Turner shared in the UNDP, UNDP annual report 2022. Of course, I went there, I'm gonna, okay, let me find out. And I, oh, I'm sorry. I can provide any specific information because this is a 2022 and I'm training to up to 2021. And I said, oh, oh my goodness. So must be a better way to do it. And then Deja and myself, uh, we put together something for that day. Let me just try to put my, uh, yeah, my browser here. And we said, okay, let's put uh, architecture together. This session is not gonna be a technical presentation, but I would love just to highlight a few points for you. So basically we have a way to ingest the documents using um, Azure. So your documents will be hosted on whatever you are. That could be a number of type of storages, could be SharePoint online and so on and another possibilities there. We are going to uh, search around your files and we are going to ingest to GPT, to our Azure OpenAI GPT, in order to summarize and build in your answer and exposure this to a website. That could be your website or in a demonstration environment that I'm gonna to show you what we call MVP, Minimum Viable Products. We have this site to where I, I ingest a number of UNDP documents, around 20 something documents, including uh, these reports. So now I'm gonna to perform to UNDP exactly the same question to, so the main difference now is uh, I have your documents searchable and I will be able to summarize it using uh, Azure OpenAI. So I'm gonna to perform exactly the same question uh, and I'm gonna to just uh, go here. As you can see, now I have, let me use, yeah, okay. Now I have the answer. And now I have the sources of this information. One of the sources of information, as you can see, is my annual report. Doesn't mean that it's only about this report. I can get these information or piece of these information in another source. And OpenAI will summarize and will present to you in the right format. So we have another type of interface that you can use as a MVP, minimum viable product. For instance, this is another type of the interface that I can be used as well. So this is a, another type of interface that I can perform exactly the same questions and have exactly the same answer. So just to highlight for you the possibilities that you can do with OpenAI, uh, where you have a number of the documents, you have a growth machine um, developing new data. So must be a way to basically consolidate and present this in a better way. So this is what we have today for the, this demonstration proposal. And we'll be here to answer any questions after the, during the uh, Q&A. Thank you so much. And now hand off to Tejan. Thank you. All right, give me a sec here to pull it up for you. Uh, hi, everyone. While Steve is uh, pulling that up, I'll reintroduce myself. I'm uh, Tasia, and I'm uh, the Data and AI Cloud Solution Architect that supports uh, the UN system. I work with some of you uh, directly on projects and um, looking forward to, to talking more about the responsible AI side of uh, OpenAI. Thank you, Steve. So uh, what this uh, 
slide is showing is our journey as Microsoft with responsible AI. So uh, as Steve mentioned, we're in a, uh, a shift uh, technology-wise and also uh, as, as humanity. And I, and I hate to, to, to be uh, dr dramatic. Um, I, I was thinking about this before uh, we started. And also uh, it's so exciting to see all of you from around the world on this call. In the United States, we have this cartoon called uh, Winnie the Pooh, and there's this character called Eeyore. And I remember as a child really identifying with this character because he was just so practical. Everyone was so had a big bubbly personality and was very friendly, but Eeyore had the sense about him where he was just, uh, I called him a pragmatic. And I think that it balanced out the, the show because everyone else was so friendly. And when it comes to technology, we have, things that are balancing, that we have to balance in, in conjunction with uh, evolution. We have to consider other things. And two of those main things is security. We all know that we have a responsibility for security, especially when it comes to data. But one that, other, that some groups don't talk about as much is responsible AI. And in around 2016, Microsoft adopted the mindset of responsible AI being our, our responsibility and actually the responsibility of anyone who is embarking on an artificial intelligence journey. Because by nature, artificial intelligence is mimicking human behavior. And so we have to be careful in how we apply it uh, and make sure we have the proper guardrails. And so it's not to minimize uh, progress, but to make sure that we do it in a responsible way. And so what this slide is showing is Microsoft's long, well, not, well, 2016, but remember artificial intelligence, machine learning as industry is, is quite new in, uh, to begin with. But we made this commitment and uh, we're not, I'm not gonna go through all of these slides. Um, we can actually go to the, to the next one. It really focuses on three, on six major pillars, and those six major pillars uh, are fairness, privacy, and security. Again, uh, security is quite important. Transparency, reliability, and safety, inclusiveness, and accountability. And this is the vantage point prior to large language models and this uh, this burst of new capabilities. These pillars were applied were applied to our internal uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence, as well as made available to any users of Microsoft. So in, embedded in our technology, uh, things like Azure Machine Learning, we have the, a dashboard that gives you a, a overview of these uh, six pillars. And then we also have this open source. So this is available regardless of what tools you're using outside of Microsoft, we've made this these available. But now that we have embarked on a new journey with large language models, we've had to make some extensions to this framework. And we started before we even released Azure, Machine, Azure OpenAI to the public, we infused it with uh, responsible AI. Uh, and I can talk a little bit more about that on, on the next slide. And so when you, and I know some of you have already, um, perhaps some of you already have access, when you get access to Azure Machine Learning, and Azure Machine Learning is specifically for custom use cases. So the one that Hugo showed with the knowledge mining, that is that would be a custom solution. You don't necessarily need a custom solution for all of your use cases. Maybe it's embedded in your Power Apps or an Office 365, but if you wanna build maybe an organizational-wide solution, you will need uh, something like an API to, to, to integrate it into your own applications. And if you get access to, to that, automatically it's gonna come with some content filtering. And that is uh, something that you can opt out of. But the reason why it's there is to protect you and your end users for abuse. So it automatic, it runs alongside the models and uh, triggers if, if certain types of questions are asked, it triggers a system and content is stored. And I won't dive too much into that, but in this framework, and this is a guide for how you all can think of it as an organization of your use of large language models is that one, just like security is the responsibility of everyone. And at these different levels, you can integrate this responsible AI from the beginning. So at the, the model itself, the, uh, the, the service itself, you can integrate 
use Microsoft's integration or, or add upon it or, or build your own, you can add safety systems around the model. And then you can add uh, things along this along the application. So this is this would be for any applications that along this, the same lines of any other applications that you build as an organization. You can do things like user uh, throttling, meaning that you minimize. If you ever use ChatGPT, they actually do this. Then you can only you do I think twenty five messages per uh, three hours. This is something that you can do. You can also, if someone asks a particular type of question, you can shut down their access, at least for a certain amount of time. And then on the outer uh, circle, it's about education, just like what we're doing in this call, um, making sure that your end users are understanding what this technology is, how, how amazing it is, how capable it is, how much uh, it can transform and make your work more productive, but also making sure that you're looking at it more right now as a co-pilot to work alongside you and not as autopilot to make sure that um, you're, you're thinking about how, what's the possible cases where this may not, where this can hurt someone else. And so you wanna set up those guardrails. And I'll once I'm done, I'm gonna share a link to some of our responsible AI toolkits and especially related to responsible AI. And so that you can uh, start to read and, 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 and kind of understand that, that side of it. And I know we'll have questions at the end. So in, in summary, just want to, oh, oh, go ahead. I forgot, <laughs> I have one more slide. So this is quite important. Questions that we always have. Uh, your, your data is your data. So Microsoft does not use your data in the retraining of any of our, in, in, in any of our models. This doesn't just apply to Azure Machine Learning. I mean, Azure OpenAI, it applies to all of our cognitive services or if you use any of our um, uh, APIs and your data is, is used to train your model, the model that and then you will, um, you would, well, Microsoft will not own that model. That will be your, your information and in, in, uh, protected. And uh, as far as security controls, Azure, it's the same security that you can ex expect from Azure in general. And when you create a resource in Azure, you get added protections like role-based access control, the ability to set up uh, private endpoints. So it's, a, and it's there for enterprise level solution where you can make sure that it's protected and only those who need access to it can access to it. So you will have all the ability to control the access of your resource uh, once, crea uh, once created. And so in summary, um, responsible AI is a, is a mindset and that needs to be extended for large language models. And Microsoft is here to work alongside you to understand uh, those risks and make sure that you build uh, responsible solutions that support uh, the work that you do. Yeah, so, thank. You. Okay, yeah, Steve, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just gonna say I want to thank everyone for for the time. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, Babatunde, I know you'll be you'll be moderating. Janine Janine did tell me asked me if I had any things I wanted to bring up, and I didn't have any at the beginning, but now I just remembered. Microsoft Build is next week. It's a digital event, and there's a ton of new announcements. So if you're interested in AI, there's going to be a ton of announcements around that. If you're interested in Power BI. A lot of cool announcements coming around that and then anything around data platform. So if you're into data, this is the time we're making some groundbreaking uh, announcements next week. So it's all digital and free. So just go to look up build on, uh, on Google and, and you'll be able to, to, to register and, and watch the events uh, digitally. Uh, thanks. So you said build, B-U-I-L-D? Correct. All right. Perfect. All right. We'll, we'll <laughs> sign up for that as much as we can. All right. Thanks. Uh, Thanks again, Ugo, Tasha, and uh, Steve for this. So I see there's some questions already in the in the chats for, from colleagues. And for others that want to ask a question directly, if you can also just uh, raise your hand. Uh, so maybe we we'll start with Chris. Chris, you want to ask a question? And thanks, Jenny, for putting the link here. I don't know if Chris is still there. Otherwise, it's a question on the, on the publication at New York Times uh, on Microsoft finding from so the finding from one of the researchers. I don't have the link. Microsoft says new AI shows signs of human reasoning, something like that. 
Have, have you ever seen the article or not? Yeah, I saw I, I saw that article. Uh, I think it was yesterday or the day before, and I've, I've I pulled up the research paper to the 125 pages, and I hadn't started to read it yet. Um, <laughs> but I am aware of it, and I, I think generally what it's probably going to say is, and Tej is always reminding me of this, is that we're still learning the capabilities of the models um, right. that we've built, and so we're starting to see. I think the term was a spark of intelligence, like spark of of, of things reasoning, and I think that that. That was where they were they were leading to, but I haven't read the paper yet. I don't know, Tasia, if you've had a chance in one day <laughs> to see that paper. No, I ha I was just pulling it up. Unfortunately, I'm not open AI. I wish I could just read it right away and <laughs> process it. Um, and I, I hate to comment off of a headline. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, but um, but I just would I would just uh, um, piggyback off of what uh, Steve said that every day we're learning uh, the new capabilities. Um, mm -hmm. Of, of opening of of these uh, technologies. Yep. Good. No thanks, um, Hugo. You, you know, what you showed earlier was very interesting for for us in UNDP, right? It's uh, you, know, you pulled some of our documents and there's an interface here to analyze it. Um, you know, there's a lot out there that uh, UNDP has produced the past uh, you know, and whatever years that the NDP has been around, uh, including the UN. Uh, so there's, I think we'll at some point get to the place where we wanna be able to learn from all those documents, right? Um, so I think that's the part where we need to figure out together uh, in terms of this partnership with uh, Microsoft and how you know, we build from that. Right? I don't know if you wanna say anything quickly on that, but I also have a question related to I know the answer between uh, Microsoft topics and stuff and this kind of interface, but it would be good if it's you, Steve, or Hugo, or Tisha, that can say a little bit about that for colleagues. Yeah, so I, I can come in on, on the, the, the Viva topic. So just within the last week, uh, we announced, so essentially, like I said before, we're integrating Copilot into every, you're not gonna go anywhere in Microsoft stuff without seeing a Copilot that pops up. And I will comment that the word co-pilot is very intentionally used as a, it's not an autopilot, it's not Tesla driving down the highway and you're watching a movie, it's meant as an augmentation, a tool for you to help help do things. Uh, but we will be integrating co-pilot into Viva Topics as well so that you can start to chat with those topics that you guys have been spending uh, time working on. So I'm very much keeping an eye on it. And as soon as we have access to these, these type of things, we are expecting a lot of the co-pilots to enter into more mainstream previews towards the end of the year. Um, but as soon as we get those, UNDP has been a, a, um, an early adopter of the, of the Viva topics, and we're going to make sure you guys get, get access to those technologies as quick as possible. Thanks. Hugo, do you want to say anything? McDonald, I don't know if you want to, or you had some comments. Uh, yeah, so uh, related to the demonstration uh, itself, so uh, super excited for the possibilities. Uh, we have been uh, deploying this uh, in a number of uh, customers, including uh, uh, UN colleagues as well, and other entities here. Uh, and uh, the results that we have so far are incredible in terms of the possibilities to have in your fingers the summarization of a ton of documents that you have for decades. So in, a, in how to better have access for this information to take decisions. I think that that's the, the, the right point to, to make and how to make decisions fast. And uh, this is what we are framing this out in a, for sure that uh, potentially almost 100% of the people here already play at least a little bit with the chat GPT in somehow with the open. And uh, you saw sometimes different answers uh, where you are able to see that uh, you have uh, different answers for the same questions and sometimes it's not the right answer. So we, we are able to see that. So the, the, the good news for this is when you set up your systems in order to chat with your, with your own data, you have mechanisms in order to fine turning the way that you're going to interact with your data to saying if chat GPT going forward if you don't know the answer, say, I don't know. I don't have the reference. 
I think this is the one of the main point here to highlight that uh, when you're going to chat with your data, you will own the chat GPT instance instead of UNDP. You can call it as a UNDP GPT or something around it. And you're going to frame this out on the safe guard hails in order to be sure that the answers that you're going to have from the systems is gonna be the right answers. So that's that's the uh, a key point here that you can frame this out as well around the responsible AI as Tasha showed us here. And for sure that we can go deep dive on that in terms of responsible AI, the dashboard that we have available in order to help UNDP to succeed. But the main point is doing everything with your responsibility, framing this instance uh, in order to be sure that you're going to have the right information from your data, the data that you produce every day, you will be able to share to your, your, with your data in real time. As soon as you deploy it uh, in your storage or your data lake, you will be able to have this available through the generative AI tools that we showed this morning. I think this is the main the main point here for from from my perspective in terms of the demonstration itself. Is that a, make sense? No, it does, and I think that's very helpful. I, I think it's important to, you know, what you said and what the emphasis that Tisha has been putting on this, right? Um, the the chat GPT and OpenAI thing is there. Right? It's, there's uh, public use of it. Um, and then for an organization like UNDP, now we need to make it understand how we work and um, how things are in the organization so that we can be able to use it responsibly. Right? Uh, I think that's uh, that's a part uh, that we, the journey that we need to go on together uh, the next uh, couple of months uh, to understand our role is out. And that's, uh, Chris, I see you are asking in terms of UNDP rolling this out. Yes, there's, we're having a lot of conversations right now and trying to test and see how this is going to be done uh, effectively within the organization. I can't give you a timeline right now, but uh, we'll at some point come back uh, with the next few weeks as we go through the details of the sessions. Uh, Bukawa, do you want to ask a question? Yes, yes, sure. Um, I don't know if everyone can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Um, yes, I was just uh, curious, um, especially about translation APIs. Um, you know, obviously with more common languages, it's obviously there's more accuracy with a lot of these AI generated content, or maybe if you're willing to do something like data analysis, you're able to sort of get generate some content from that, from common languages, but I'm curious about um, uncommon languages. So, you know, maybe uh, languages in Central Asia, like Azeri and all of these like smaller um, minor languages, does that need um, customization? And if it does, is it still as accurate? Because from my understanding, large language models um need quite or are, are, are need quite a uh, a large body of content to be fed and obviously these uncommon languages don't necessarily have in the internet a large uh um body of uh <laughs> content so how does that work uh, so for languages uh I don't have the official list uh, of, of languages that it supports, but uh, it's it's most proficient in English. And the more the, and, and because of the, as you mentioned, the data that it was programmed on, it, it does have an influence of the proficiency in different languages. As the as the models, the different versions of the models uh, improve, the language capabilities are improving. So with GPT-4, uh, not only are uh, more languages, uh, it's not a fish, it's not an official list of languages, more languages are supported and the translations between languages are are improving. The The answer to the, the question is, um, it's, it's basically, as you mentioned, it depends on how 
how much uh, data the, the is available for that language, but you have options. So it's a long way to say that you would, a lot of languages do very well with OpenAI, but so I would say test the language and see for yourself, to, to not to rule it out because it was uh, trained on such a large data set, but if it's not proficient enough on the language that you're sh uh, shooting for, there, there are two options that I would recommend. One is a, to pair it with a translation service, as you mentioned, like Microsoft has translation services, or uh, to fine tune the model with the language itself, because you have the ability to fine tune some of the models. So you can, uh, if you have quality samples in that language, you can train the model to be improved in that language. Uh, so out of the box, uh, uh, it, it supports many different, I was trying to find the official list, but I couldn't find it. It supports many different languages. English is by far the, 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 the most prominent language. And, uh, and then second, you have options to either pair it with translation service or train the model to, uh, with the, the language of your choice or languages of your choice to make sure that the, that it has more of that that data. So essentially it's just the data that it was was trained on. And there's more, there's things like embeddings that can also improve uh, language uh, uh, functionality. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's awesome, Tasha. Uh, and a great question. Uh, I have a, another question for you. So are you targeting like a, something in real time Oh, this is going to be based on the documents that are, that you have already in. A, so if you could explain a little bit more about the use case, I would love to know more about it, please. Yeah, sure. It, I mean, it could be um, both, actually. So um, it's, it's mostly used for um, some of our sessions when we're engaging with uh, um, our country offices and municipalities within this region, I mean, Europe and Central Asia. Mm -hmm. So what usually happens is we engage in social listening activities. Mm -hmm. So that kind of requires sometimes, you know, online interviews or not interviews per se, but like trying to derive some insights from uh, a group of people and then with those insights synthesize to get some themes and patterns usually that the, the, that is the use case so it could work in real time or even if it doesn't work in real time per se uh, also the after math when mm -hmm. when now we sit down and we start trying to analyze the 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 the, the data that we uh, gathered from the social listening uh, sessions so because it's primarily people from this region sometimes you need maybe uh, mm -hmm. uh something that could translate more accurately Mm -hmm. You know, so I mean, at the moment, obviously, we, um, uh, what, what we use is normally in-house translation and the translation services, like, for example, as Tasia has mentioned, which is OK. But like, obviously, we're speaking about generative AI right now. So we're trying to see if is there anything that could possibly accurately translate m much, much uh, quicker. Uh, so that that's the use case. I hope I was able to explain it um, well. Yeah, yes, absolutely. So just, Hugo, just to quickly uh, give you a little bit of background in addition to what uh, was saying, is we also have like colleagues in the accelerator labs that do uh, deep listening and, uh, and uh, go into the field and talk to people in the community and all of that. Right? Um, so I think it's a combination of all of the, those kind of work that we do, usually given UNDP as one of the country offices uh, globally, uh, and people are working, interacting with the communities in different ways. And also, uh, Chris was asking earlier, what about uh, video content or something like that? Mm -hmm. No, this is uh, really amazing use cases. So uh, as Stacia said, for offline content, for instance, uh, from a meeting that you have the transcript in English, we, you can use the kind of pair services in order to translate your target language. So I can share here the language support that we have for this translator language support. Uh, this is the list that we have for 
of paired services that we can have in order to back forth to open AI and translate back to English and translate back to the, the targeted language that are, we have a quite good results from that. Uh, we have been working with uh, customers, uh, a customer, a specific customer in New York uh, is a church, the big church community, and they have a uh, uh, target for many countries, including Asia, and they are using it. They are quite happy with the results that we have so far. And uh, when the open AI doesn't support this by default, so we can have this possibility. For real time, this is a, another type of possibilities here. So uh, this could be through Teams. Uh, we have uh, an amazing roadmap for a few things related to generative AI as well that we can work with the product product group team uh, to bring it to them, your specific use cases and try to make this uh, happen for you because this is a super amazing use case for sure. And I, I believe that we can work together in, in something related to real time. That The content that is not real time, as I said, we can work in with uh, whatever is supported today in the open AI. If it's not supporting the open AI in a native, modes we can use the past services with the, the the table with the language support that we have there okay thanks and i see that there's been a couple of questions and interaction on the chat from mcdonald uh mcdonald do you want to chime on or are you good McDonald, are you still there? Uh, I think the sound is not working. Okay, Steve, I think it's maybe you can help uh, with this. It's uh, happy to hear more about the research side of the future of work as impacted by AI. Uh, as work stroke tasks have been optimized, what are the future of roles look like? Uh, will future roles be comprehensive since so we automatically have co-pilots for every possible task? Uh, how will roles remain the same as this could be a breakthrough to work-life balance? No, I, I definitely think it can can be both a, a breakthrough for work-life balance. I think it offers the opportunity to, I don't know about you, but I always, you know, I shut my computer off and I'm never at zero emails in my inbox, right? And so like I flag them and then I never get back to them. So you know, I, I know Baba Tunde, I've done that to you too before. Where I never get back to you. And a week later, I'm like, oh yeah, you asked me a question. Um, so I think there's definitely a capability and potential to do that. I did post in there, Microsoft research does a lot of research on this. And so we, on we there's an article recently published within the last week of our research on how AI will impact workforce. So, so take a look at that. The thing that I'm excited though, even beyond work-life balance is just the opportunity to be more creative, less of the drudge work, like move data from here to put it over here. Instead, let me imagine what I want. Like this, the stuff that we're putting into Power Apps is like, cause I used to do a lot of load code, no code stuff in my life over the last 20 years. And the idea that I just go to a prompt and say, build me an application that does this. And it builds the database, the data model, the front end UI, and by the way, it adds a chat interface so I can talk to that data within a few seconds. Like, I think that that's just groundbreaking and changing. The other thing that I find very interesting that we'll be, see the change, because I, I always talk to a person, I think I'm doing awesome with ChatGPT and I'm all, and learning how to do this. I'm starting to integrate it in my work life, or work life. And then I learned to meet somebody else who's doing even more, right? And so I think that we're really gonna see a shift in roles, but the one I wanted to flag was, I always think about summarize a report. You know, tell me the top 10 things, okay. But what if I took that report and say, shh, you know, write a contrarian view of this report. So if I wrote this thing, I can get feedback to help me make it better, right? So there's, there's like layers and layers of how you can potentially use this tool to make your, make, make things better. And, and one of the cool uh, things we heard, I think two days ago was um, the OCHA, they work on like a lot of grant management, distribution of funds. Well, people that are really good at writing grants get all the money and organizations that don't write the grants very well don't. So could you build this co-pilot into that grant system to help the small organizations that maybe don't aren't used to writing and don't have grant writers on retainer to be able to help say, hey, your project, your grant application would be better if you did X, right? So I think there's just so many different layers that we can apply this technology that we're just 
learning too. I know it got a little off tangent from the work-life balance and in there, but I do think it will, will also, also help with that as well. Yeah, no, thanks, Steve. And I see that uh, Bukawa and colleagues agreed. All right, so uh, we have seven more minutes. Uh, we try to we try to end this, uh, not to go beyond nine o'clock. Uh, but that's uh, I, let me see. Does anybody have any other questions? I don't think there's any question that I missed in the chat. Um, so I think for for our side, right? So, on Monday we discuss uh, the comp the cost of some of these things, right? So, um, the, I don't know if you can describe a little bit for us in UNDP or for people to you know. It's the computing power, and so every time you ask a question, what happens? Right? <laughs> uh, so I think just uh, some idea of what is happening in the background uh, and how this thing works, and then not necessarily in terms of pricing for you. But you can, yeah. Yeah, just just kind of a high level. So it's the stuff that we're adding all the co-pilots. Um, again, most of them are all in preview or just being announced. So a lot of those things are just just starting to know. We don't even know the details of that or how they will be be included. But they, those things that are part of the SaaS product would just be like subscription pricing that you would, you know, work through with Sylvain and, and and the team there to 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 add those things. The custom solutions, the stuff that show the Hugo showed within Azure. It's the way that it's built is on a consumption basis. So it's like the number of chat messages you send in and the responses that comes back, right? That's kind of the, uh, the billing model. So if it's a, you know, a system that's used five times a day, then you're paying like 10 cents. Like if it's used a hundred thousand times and you put it out on the internet and everybody that accesses UNDP's website, the cost would then reflect how many people are chatting with it. So it's really a range, but it's, it's consumption based. So it kind of, kind of meets you where you're at. And just so that uh, colleagues can understand, this is on the Azure tenant, right? So it sits on the Azure and then it's just the computing power and the time on that, right? Yep, just computing power in the cloud uh, as part yep. of your Azure and the stuff that uh, that IT and, and a lot of the, I know you have like probably around 100 different subscriptions for all the different regions and, and country offices that, that, that are taking advantage of it. Right. Uh, Ugo, if, uh, if, if People are asking questions every second, and we have uh, twenty thousand staff in UNDP, and they're busy on this. Uh, <laughs> is this <laughs> like a twenty-four hour uh, computer running, or what? What does this look like? So yes, uh, <laughs> this is a uh, when we use set up uh, environment, for instance, in in Azure, the the chat GPT in Azure. This is a uh, instance that, that that you have dedicated for you it's a uh, yes uh, 24 by 7. I, I don't know Teja, if you wanted to add and we have a, additional questions from Chris here that she has uh hands up hi uh, yes thanks can, can anybody hear me yes yeah go ahead Chris so I'm back home now um I just I'm curious, um, what, what, you know, like Babatunde, like you had mentioned um, about 24/7. So, I, um, and again, I'm a, I'm a very beginner user of of AI. So, in terms of within our own system, when UNDP, I guess, eventually rolls this out, what is the level of curation in terms of, you know, um, not just necessarily the the the, the rules or confines of how we manage our data, but also, you know, if, if you, I'm, I'm, I'm somebody sitting in front of my uh, UNDP internet site and I say, hey, can you pull out this report and this and this and this, um, can we be, uh, can we be assured that this is something that the actual, that, that the system actually pulls up for you, I guess, no bias in a sense? Um, that you can totally rely on this thing to pull out the things that you actually ask of it and not to not to say that is it is sentient, but to say that it, it would have inherent biases in itself, that it would not pull out things that, or, or it would pull out things that you think it's not needed. Sorry, if I can't explain it further <laughs> or more clearly. Thank you. Teja, do you wanna talk about bias and how we kind of try to address that from? Sure. Um, Big topic. <laughs> you know, I'm trying. 
I was going through it in my head with, with three minutes uh, left. I think that's a very important question. And uh, from the framework of responsible AI, I'm excited that you asked that question because uh, you have to uh, you have to ask difficult questions uh, to make sure that you're ensuring a solution that again is um, that you're thinking about the possible impacts. So the short answer is uh, there are there are biases. So for example, it's based on the data the data that is trained on. So one of the biases is not necessarily a bias, or you could think of it as a bias is when we talked about language because it was tra trained mostly on on English and other languages. Then it's more proficient in those those languages and so there is uh so bias is not static right and so there are larger um they're agreed upon biases like some are you know language uh gender uh ethnicity biases those are being actively worked on through the model and with again with advancements like gpt4 things like language representation is increasing uh gender bias is decreasing uh but because it is not static and it depends on the values of the organization itself and what what is important to the organization we have tools to help you identify the biases that that you want to make sure that you mitigate uh and and there are tools that we have to help you uh mitigate that and and some of them are within the engineering of the system itself of uh, prompt engineering uh, and also uh, with fine tuning of the of the fine tuning of the model, but there's a lot of ways to ensure one the accuracy of the data. Um, you, you can absolutely get the right information, just as Hugo demoed. Uh, if you're asking it something for your your organization, you can point it directly to your documents and make it to, to ensure uh, that it's right. And there's other in, uh, engineering controls that allows you to to do that as well. Uh, and then. So accuracy and then bias is is actually a complex idea, right? And so that is something that has to be, and this is prior to large language models. Remember, this is artificial intelligence. So even before this, if you were developing a machine learning model that you were going to use for your application, you would need to identify the biases and do adversarial tests in order to ensure. So it's the same, it's on the same level. It's still the, the responsibility of the developer of the of the, the model. To consider these biases and to ensure that it is minimized right before uh, sharing it with end users. So I don't know if that answers your question, but absolutely in general, OpenAI and, and the models are attacking bias. And specifically, when applied, they need to be implied in the context of the values of the organization itself. Uh, and that's we could talk about this for another three days. I, and I would love to <laughs> dive more into it. <laughs> Yeah. Um, no, thanks. Th th thanks so much. I mean, um, it does, but on the flip side, also, I think my thinking again, and because you know, it's we're a UN organization, we're not necessarily always at the forefront of technology and using these things. And I know there are colleagues who are not comfortable navigating the digital space. So some of it is also interactive in a sense, it's like. Do we then have to train our staff to ask the right questions to find the right information? It's part of that. And that is my concern. And I hope that as these things get rolled out and that is part of the consideration is really, hey guys, this is how you can ask this question. This is how you refine it, et cetera, et cetera. And that's part of it, not just the bias, but also asking the right questions for you to get the right answers. Over. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. There's a lot of interest in this, and thanks, Chris, for this. I think it's important for us to be to, you know, learn more about this and how it works, and you know, change management and all of that. And I think that's a bit of a journey that we all go through together um, as we look at this. All right. Um, thanks, Steve. Thanks, Stacia. Thanks, Hugo, for joining us today. Hopefully, we'll get you back again at some point uh, as we go through this. Right? Sounds good. Thanks. Good seeing everyone. Thank you, All everyone. Right. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.